three, two, one, zero, zero, and lift off. Welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Design's podcast on all things branding and digital marketing. Since 2008, Peralta Design has launched hundreds of brands with award-winning identities and websites. Join our hosts Ramon and Jorge as they use decades of combined experience to tackle topics with past clients, industry partners, and the rest of the PD crew. At Peralta Design, we launch brands. But for now, let's launch right into this episode of Mission Control. All right, everybody, welcome to uh, Mission Control, Peralta Designs podcast for everything branding, marketing, technology, uh, entrepreneurialism, you name it. We talk about it here if it has to do with good design and business. And we're so excited to have today a dear, dear friend of mine, one of my oldest friends. Uh, I guess that's not the right way to put it, but you know, we've known each other for a very long, very long time. We go back to to high school days. Uh, I remember Chris when he had a full head of hair, put it that way. Uh, and he used to part it to the side very gracefully. Um, those days are long gone. But uh, we have him on our show. We're very excited. Uh, he's, this guy's a prolific author. He's, uh, he's, a, he's, he's just a genius in my, in my book. And I'm so grateful to have him in my corner. I like to welcome everybody. This is Chris Jarvis. Take it away, my man. Ramon, it is great to have you, my friend. I am your oldest friend. I am, for those people watching at home, I'm actually 86 years old. I just have a fantastic skincare regimen, and You're I look a vampire. fantastic. Yeah. I am a vampire, that's correct. And I, uh, yeah, the energy vampire. But you drink giraffe blood, right? That's the thing. That's right. That's right. Out of, out of a chalice. <laughs> a chalice made of plastic, and it says 7-Eleven on it. They're very classy here. What is when that? When went away... That's right. The, that's right. The super big gulp because everybody <laughs> needs 128 ounces of Diet Mountain Dew. Oh my God! Yes. Yeah. So listen, tell us, tell us what you do because you, you know, I started out by saying you, you, you know, you're an author, but you're giving, you, you know, you hang out with Jack Canfield. You, you're making movies with Jay Abraham. How, do, how would you describe if somebody said, "What do you do?" How would you, what would you tell us? Uh, I would tell you something you wouldn't understand and, uh, and, it, and it wouldn't hit the mark and it would just be a bunch of words. So what do I do? Uh, my son, when he was 12, somebody asked him what his dad did. And he said, my dad builds businesses. And I thought, son of a bitch, the kid has it down better than I do. And I'm the marketing guy. So how does that, how does that happen? Um, what do I do? I, I'd say what I really do is I, I help people see differently. And, you know, I'm sure we'll get into the whole giraffe metaphor, but really helping disrupt the the status quo and how are you thinking about things and questioning things that may range from why are you doing what you're doing? Why is your business doing what it's doing? What is it you want? I just try to give people a better perspective on, on things. It just comes from a lot of experience and I guess a, you know, a crazy overactive brain that notices everything. So I help people see differently and then they see differently so they can business differently. If it's in a finance place, I'm helping them see differently so they can money differently. And, I guess that's the best I can do. Well, well we, can, we can defer to Tyler, who says I, I build businesses. Well, maybe that's just better. right. Well, I mean, that's that's a noble a noble thing to do to build businesses and and help our economy. Lord knows right now that that uh, you know we need we need more businesses to launch. And and as you know, our our mantra is we launch brands. But let me ask you, why do you do it? Because you you know you're uber successful, right? You're you you know. You've built companies, you've sold companies, uh, you know, you live in a gigantic house somewhere uh, in, in, in the heart of Texas. Uh, you have every reason at this point to just kind of hang up, you know, uh, hang it up and just kind of chill. And, 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 and instead, you continue to help others. Why, why is this your mission now after, after having after written all these books and, and so forth? Why do you do it? Yeah, I'd say there's two things, and there were a number of events in my life that led me to this, but I can remember having a very significant conversation with my parents and it was actually the Christmas after my younger sister had died. Mm -hmm. And I went back home to check on my parents since it would be the, and they're not married to each other, they both live alone. So, you know, they're approaching Christmas as alone and, you know, suffering the loss of a child, which, you know, is a horrible thing. But I remember asking them, what the hell should I do? Because I was given all these fantastic gifts. My younger sister was given a lot of challenges and transgender, mental illness, mm -hmm. um, you know, really struggled. And, you know, to an outsider's perspective, my life is a bed of roses and hers was, you know, pretty horrible. Um, 
And just asking my parents, like, what the hell should I do? And feeling some guilt about having all these gifts. Did, and, you, have, did you have survivor's guilt? Or did you feel... Yeah, I think that... Yeah, sure. Because we're, we were 18 months apart. And that could have yeah. been... That could have been me. And you realize we're born in the same house. We have the same parents. We... Great that this first child, middle child. So, okay, I give myself a little bit of, you know, perhaps a little head start there. But, yeah, a little bit of survivor's guilt. But it was more of a... To me, it was more of a... I was given all these gifts. What am I supposed to do with them? More than it was, ooh, I should be dead or she should be alive. Like that wasn't the, the thought was, what am I going to do with this because I have all these gifts? And in talking to my parents, both of them absolutely got it. And what they said to me made a lot of sense. And this is Christmas of 2016. And I had sold my, uh, 2017 and I sold my company in 2016. And their response was, you need to do two things. One, you've got an overactive brain. It's constantly flying around. You're going to need to be intellectually stimulated. There's no way you're going to be able to sit home and play the banjo or whittle things or, you know, do rose gardening. They, you're just not going to be able pressure, to do it. Did they put pressure on you to, cause I know your dad was an athlete. I want to, I want to kind of talk a little bit about that. That's just, uh, even though I'm a Yankees fan, uh, I, I do I, I do find that fascinating, and I'm so grateful that I that day I got to go drive up to Boston to hear you speak, and I got a chance to meet him, and I could tell how proud he was of you. Did they, uh, you know, did they put a lot of pressure on you to be successful? No, uh, directly, no. I would say my parents put absolutely no pressure on me, and they, you know, do your thing, and they were always cool with whatever I did and never pushed me to do, never pushed me to try harder really at anything in my life ever. There was no, my dad had played for the Red Sox. He had uh, made it to the major leagues, got hurt mm. had his career, you know, submarined and everybody's like, Oh, your dad made it to, you know, played major league baseball. And even in the last month of his life, uh, he died this past April. He came to stay with me for a month. And the, you know, the statement was, from him was everybody looks at my career as this great, fantastic accomplishment because I made major league baseball. He said, I look at my career as an utter failure because I had every intention of making the hall of fame. I got hurt and never got a chance to do it. So he's like, I don't look at this with any pride. I look at it as I missed on something I really wanted to do. And I put 20 years of my life into it. So yeah, he's, you know, he, so he never pushed me at sports ever. I mean, there was a time when you and I were in high school together, wow. you may or may not recall, but um, we had a great basketball team, state champions one year, finalists another, quarter finalists another, and I was named captain of that team as a junior. And we had a great team that year. Yeah. And I remember a newspaper reporter asking him, "Where's Where's Chris's future?" And he's he's wondering, "Is this baseball like Dad, or is this basketball? Where's it going to be?" Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know this conversation was happening until it was printed in the Providence Journal the next morning. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad, without even looking away from the court, just said, "Math." <laughs> exactly so you know, he oh, happened to be right but you can imagine how much i got my chops busted like hey where's your math ball i mean that was a big um yeah. you know, there was a lot of guys teasing me with yeah, you I, 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 in those days i i remember i ran track just for that one i think my freshman year you know cross country very briefly but for the for the majority of my my high school i you know i worked i worked at my dad's garage after school and yep. I, I do remember you guys uh you know, uh, you know, you, Pridham, you know, Lando, uh, uh, Joey, uh, uh, Tamburini. I, I just remember like, you know, these guys were the jocks or you guys got to play a lot of the sports. Um, and, sure. uh, and I think you and I would have, would have, would have been, would have made great teammates. And I guess now we sort of are, um, as strategic partners, uh, in business. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those, those were the, those were the good old days and, and, um, much, it's much better to end strong than start strong. My friend, let me tell yeah, you, it's yeah, better to, it uh, is, it is. Do you remember that time we were on the highway? I think we were, we had, we, we were racing or something. I, I just have this vision. I think I had prom my, night, prom night. And you had, you had, you had a BMW and I had the RX-7. My, do you remember that? Yeah. My step, my <laughs> stepfather's BMW. And I, and, 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 and if this airs and my son sees it, I'm going to strangle you because, it oh is a you, you you know leave the we'll, story that we'll and all Danny the MPHs will stay yeah. out of it. We'll have That's Danny. right. Have all the MPHs and where we were and how stupid we were. Yes, right, there are plenty right. of ridiculous things. Right, I, right, right. I vaguely I recall enough to know <laughs> I should I shouldn't have answered that question on a recorded uh, video and audio program. So you got into math, right? So your your dad's like math. Now, how did that start your math career? I know you went to URI. But like, nope, I went there to be an engineer and, yeah. you know, first kid to go to college, I had no guidance. So I didn't go to Brown or some of the schools that I probably yeah. academically could have Party gone school, to, but probably, much. 
Yeah, yeah, I was. And I, you know, I didn't do much work there. I graduated pretty easily and yeah. had a pretty fantastic career there in leadership positions and won a man of the year award and did a lot of stuff and had a lot of fun at the same time. But I majored in math to go to law school. I didn't go, I didn't major in math to do, you know, for any other reason. I, I just, it was easy. It came easily to me. So I went into that to go to law school then decided I don't want to be a lawyer. Yeah, you and I grad, you know, college, we graduated high school in 88. So college should have been 92. Um, in 92, nobody had, nobody was hiring. So I happened to get a job as an actuary, making a bunch of money, thought, oh, well, nobody's making money. I'm making 30 grand a year. This is spectacular. And I recall the trying to get out of credit card debt and doing the actuarial thing, passing the exams, moving up, getting promoted, taking new jobs at new companies, getting promoted again. And I remember the day when I looked up and thought, you know, when I'm making a hundred grand a year, everything will be paid for and I'll be living high on the hog. And well, well when, when, when did the <laughs> entrepreneurial bug hit? Like, cause you're right now, okay. you're an yeah. employee. Like, where did you make that pivot to, to running your own company? Yeah. So I'm working for an insurance company. I'm taking actual exams. And I realized that these exams are set up by people who are ahead of me to make it difficult for me to get where they are. And as I'm passing them, I'm, I'm passing up, I pass one, I pass two, I pass three A, three B, yeah. three C, four A, four A, four, five A, five B. And I realize these bastards are just making this difficult for no reason other than to make it hard <laughs> for me to challenge them. And what really troubled me was none of the stuff I was learning was information I was using in my job. This was just, let's take the bar exam 15 times and we'll make you go through it every time right. just so you can have a seat at the table. And, when, and once I realized that I could do the work and I could pass it, and I didn't really need this stuff. I said, I'm done with this career. And I just tossed it, uh, applied to business schools. The only top 10 school that let me in was UCLA. I went out there with every intention of becoming a management consultant or some type of, uh, you know, finance jock or something on Wall Street. And I'll go make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And I get there. I remember it was the second or third day. They have us take a Myers-Briggs test. And then they ask everybody, you know, are you an INFJ? Are you an ENTP? Are you whatever it might be? Mine came up ENTP, extrovert, intuitive, uh, thinking, and um, perceiving. And, and, and then they went through like all the personality types. And so, of course, there's two, four, eight, 16 different ones. They get to the one that's mine and basically say, you few people will be terrible employees. You can't work for somebody else. And I thought, fantastic. I just gave up a job. I came back here to find a, to do a career change. And now you're putting the added pressure of, this is music I have to, to find ears. an idea. Yeah. I got I to find an idea and then <laughs> launch the damn thing. And I'm going into debt to be here thinking I'm going to pay it off with my signing bonus at McKinsey or Bain or somewhere else. And uh, I was like, oh, all right, well, maybe we're going to, but, but, it, but it actually spoke to me. So when I did the personality test, that was the first time uh, I'd always felt like I, I didn't fit in with anybody. I mean, I would have times and moments and glimpses of I might fit in with the jocks on this thing, but I might fit, fit in with the intellects over here. I might fit in with some party people here. I could fit in with people who were black, white, Hispanic, you know, Asian. Did, you know, I, I had a lot of friends in a lot of different groups, mm -hmm. and but I didn't. But I never felt like I fit in. I was never the avatar that fit in with everybody else in a group. So I, I lived a relatively lonely existence. And then finally at business school in that September orientation of 1996, reading the Myers-Briggs was like, oh shit, somebody gets me because this is exactly how I am. I get excited about certain things. I have these ideas. Um, and so what was more important about that than the outcome was, was truly diving into what, it is, what is it that you know about yourself and, and to try and figure out what that is so you can then plan your life from there. And so I really haven't, there've been a couple of interesting moments in my life where I've considered employment with somebody, mm -hmm. but, uh, but they're very few and fleeting. And, and in the next uh, 24 years, I probably have seriously considered working for somebody else for maybe a grand total of six or nine months of that, you know, at some point. And I was ultimately hired when somebody bought my company and that lasted uh, uh, six and a half months. And so that didn't last very long and we parted ways. So uh, the, the key thing there was just figuring out who are you Right. And, and what skills do you have? What do you do well? And then it took me the next 20 years to figure out the draft thing and to figure out having dabbled in helping doctors with their money. And then it was helping really wealthy people save taxes. And then it how was did you, helping How did you get businesses. into, because when, when we first reconnected, you were, you were involved with Dr. Um, how mm -hmm. did you f kind of take this math path to doctors? You know, how did you end up you know, because you were looking to work for a financial firm initially. Yeah, I mean, I was always more interested in strategy consulting than I was into 
that was my thought, really. The main thought going into business school was strategy consulting, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, uh, one of the big strategy houses, which is a new project all the time, go in, solve their problem, give them the plan and get the hell out of the way. Mm -hmm. Which if I had to be in any career other than what I'm doing, that's probably the only one that would give me a shot at mm -hmm. having any sense of um, uh, faith that I wouldn't kill myself and everybody around me. You mm -hmm. know, so it was, that one was probably the closest, but the pivot was, for me, the, the math brain is more of a, um, if you put people under a functional MRI, I didn't find this till I was much older, under a functional MRI, most people, when they do a math problem, it's the left side of the brain that is trying to organize the rows and the columns and adding and processing. But for a math savant, which I would call myself, um, it's the right side of the brain. So I'm not just doing the equation. I'm actually doing it in my head five or six different ways and which one is the most elegant or the quickest solution. So I have this knack of seeing connections to things that, um, you have Rayman. Other people don't. You're like Rayman. Uh, you know, 10 minutes to walk here, baby. You better wrap <laughs> this thing up because I got somewhere to be. <laughs> Listen, the reason I'm asking you this stuff, and, and, and I, I do want to make sure we have time to elaborate on your book and, and what you're doing now and how you're helping folks, how you've helped us at, at Peralta Design. But it's that we have a lot of listeners. I think we attract listeners that are entrepreneurs, people that are, you know, they have a day job, but they're, try, they're, they're on the fence about starting a business. They don't know when it's the right time, or they may have just gotten laid off and they feel like now's the right time because they have to kind of like what happened to me. Uh, and so I kind of want to get to you transitioning from, from that into, cause you've even had partners. I know with, with Jarvis tower, you had partners, that, that you know now you're now you're back to being solo and a lot of entrepreneurs or business owners think they need to build like big you know big giant companies with like hundreds of employees and you've 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 dabbled in all these different areas um and it hasn't been a linear path so i i really want to get some kind of tidbits that that that, that our listeners can grab and say okay now I, I can see how jarvis did that or you know my life doesn't make much sense either and his didn't sound like it did either but look where he is now you know, people, I think people have a perception that, that everything happens logically and, and, and it's not, that's not the case. Yeah, there's, so I'd say a couple of things. If, if you just lost your job, I have one word for you and that is congratulations mm. because there is no way you were living your dream job and you just got fired. There's absolutely no way that you loved it, you crushed it and everything was perfect and somebody laid you off. It's just, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. And I guess in the one in a million chance or one in a thousand chance you were loving your job and you, and you got fired, it's because your boss was a fool and didn't appreciate you for what you did. Or there was a mismatch that you thought you were doing everything that you're supposed to do, but your boss didn't. In which case you have a values mismatch, right? right. There's a serious issue of, you know, you can get into all the relationship stuff and love languages and just what currency are we trading in? And if you want, if you think you're, if you think Nancy wants uh, gifts and you work your butt off to give her a ton of money, but she She's wants quality date, time. She's a cheap date, so I'm lucky. Yeah, she wants quality time. She only wants you. Yeah. So that's you know, which which which. That's that, free. But if you thought, but if you thought it was gifts, then you could be working <laughs> your butt off to give her stuff, and she's thinking, I just want you here, and yeah. you're saying, well, you don't you don't appreciate my time. So anyway, it's the same kind of a thing in business that if someone let you go, it is a gift because that either you really weren't doing a great job because you didn't love it, or the person you were working for, the company you were working for, the people you were working with didn't appreciate you for you. Mm -hmm. And so such a big thing for me, and I've had partners, I've been kicked out of companies that I started and generated millions of dollars of value for the people who were there. Um, I can tell you getting kicked out of a company you started is not, is neither, it's not pleasant, neither is it pleasant financially. How does that happen? Is it contracts? They point to a contract and, or, I mean, cause you yeah, can't, you know, Hey, people, people have done crazy stuff for money. Mm -hmm. right? That shouldn't surprise anybody. Watch mm -hmm. any, we were my son and I were talking about uh, the Roman Empire last night. He said, if I go back in time anywhere, it would be, you know, to the Roman Empire times. And I said, Why? Uh, I, I, I love Rome. Like it is my favorite city in the world. I love the history. Everything about it is great. <laughs> but you do realize the only way to live in Rome is to kill everybody ahead of you and vomit off all the people behind you. Right, which that, you know, that part maybe, you know, but there's, there's other parts of that that might be fine, but, but it is a very difficult dog-eat-dog -dog world that if yeah. you are not ruthless, that would not be right. a good it's time like, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'll be like, next time I see him, he's like, no, you didn't take the trash. You did not take the trash out. Um, so there's, 
I'll, I'm going to have to use that. That's fantastic. For people listening, that was the thumbs down Ramon gave me, like thumbs down to me on his podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you'll have to give thumbs up or thumbs down to our terrible inside jokes and visual humor uh, on a radio, you know, on an audio pod- podcast. Right. But the, um, but, but to your point is, the, I mean, the company started, uh, mm-hmm. I remember being in a business school class doing my, doing my business plan uh, pitch, my early pitch, and a bunch of people kept ripping me for things that weren't working. And I honestly remember Pete Schombaum, who's been a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, he was in Connecticut for a long time, and now he's out in Colorado, I think. I remember him standing up to defend me, which I didn't ask him to do, but I appreciated. And he said, hey, listen, people, th- nobody's business plan is going to go according to plan. This is a direction. He's going to go, he's going to see a bunch of stuff change and he's going to pivot and that's going to be, and then you'll pivot again and again and again and again. And my business started as a pharmaceutical ad agency that became a marketing firm that became a legal referral business that became a financial referral business that became an investment, uh, an investment agency or insurance agency, which became an investment firm with hundreds of millions of dollars of assets under management. Like it changed a ton of times and then it became a high end tax practice for super wealthy people. And, you know, now I do all kinds of interesting building, business building things, you know, for people. And along the way, levels, but the business, you've written all these books too along the way. I mean, that's the other. How, what, yeah, 16, 16 books now. And that's, 16. well, as a math major, what else would I do but write books? <laughs> so that's. I don't know. Do um, some Google puzzles or something. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I took Candy Crush off my phone six months ago <laughs> at 5,790. I remember I thought, okay. you were like hooked on that. I was a. Yeah, it's just a complete waste of time. Like anybody who plays those games on the phone, it's, they're just trying to suck you into time. And again, once I realized, oh, these jerks are just trying to suck my time. Like I'm just going to delete all this stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play your game and lose. So the, um, so the book thing was, I had a business partner whose father was a doctor, and and he had this vision of how to, of how to reach them. And I had really, I hadn't done a lot of writing in my life, but you know, memos internally and things, but never, I never wrote screenplays or poetry or anything like that. Uh, and I just read his stuff and thought, okay, the message is good, but we need to connect with people. So I found this knack for connecting through words and how do you take people through a logical uh, progression. And where that comes from is my parents getting divorced, oldest of three kids, I'm eight, nine, 10 years old, devastated. And I spent you know, the better part of the next 10, 20 years, probably the next 10 years trying to get my parents back together. I spent the next 50 up until my dad died a few months ago, always thinking about how do I get my parents to talk more? How do I get them to communicate more? How do I, and I always seem to be in the middle. So I, I guess it was proof by uh, exhaustion is the math term, right? You just keep doing everything until, you know, until you've tried everything and nothing works. I guess it's, I guess it's, I guess it's, it's true, right? That the, the, the alternative is true. And so for me, I, I always wanted the connection. So for me to see connections, whether it's a connection for Peralta Design on how to connect with clients or a way for a business to generate new people or to make more money or strategic partnership, which I do a lot of you know, strategy work for people. It's because I spent so much time, um, it's because I spent so much time trying to connect two things that would never be connected, that that's a natural, maybe Freud would say that I'm, you know, that need to help me connect you with the next strategic partner is me somehow by proxy trying to, you know, fix the thing I never fixed for my parents. Like whatever it is, I don't, I don't stress about it. I just, I just know I have a gift for it. Mm-hmm. And then once you've worked with so many successful businesses, because I was in the math world, I did a lot of tax work. Well, people who want to save taxes are the people who make a lot of money. People make a lot of money, do a lot of wacky stuff. So I've worked with thousands of businesses and families who make a ton of money. They all did wacky stuff. So when I'm working with, you know, if I'm working with you, it could be, oh, here's something I learned from this auto body repair company that was doing a roll up. Or here's something I learned from import export. Or here's somebody who was doing global private equity uh, in third world countries. Or here's someone who was raising money for, you know, to do something else to bring clean water in Africa or whatever the heck the business was. I found all these weird things. So for me, those are all the variables dumped into my crazy head. And I'm constantly processing, figuring out how do I make a connection between one thing and something else. Mm-hmm. And to make that applicable to everybody on the call, um, Zig Ziglar, who's way more famous and has written far more books than I have, uh, you know, his thing is for people, especially in sales, but I think it works for everybody in business, is that if you help enough people in this world get what they want, you'll get what you want. And if, and and for all the families I work with and for most of the boards that I'm on, I would bet sight unseen if you just picked any of the boards I'm on and you went to the head of the board and said, who's the most valuable board member you have? I would think most of them would say that it's me. And it's not because I give the most money or it's not because I give the most time. It's just, I do spend a lot of time trying to make 
connections and trying to clear people away from things that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's an unfair advantage because the math brain is all about connecting things and solving puzzles. Maybe I was just given, you know, a little more candle power than some people. Yeah. Maybe it's the experience I had with a lot of really successful people, or maybe, or maybe it's all from childhood. That, that yeah. thing that I, I think you're, you know, point, <clears throat> you're very empathetic. I think you have a gift. Um, you've helped me, you've helped my company. Uh, you, you know, the questions to ask, um, you're humble, uh, you're super successful, but you, you, you're very, very well grounded. Uh, and, and, uh, I think that's what people see. So when people see that in you, they, they, uh, you have, you have an ability to get them to open up and, um, you helped me with my commencement speech, uh, when, when I, when I did the, uh, honorary doctorate there for, uh, which, which Nancy still tells me is not real, but I said, Hey, look, this was bestowed upon me. So. You know, I couldn't buy it, but thank you for, for kind of helping me craft my story. You're helping me now with my book. Um, but I, I will never forget uh, flying out there uh, when you were uh, with Jarvis Tower uh, in, in the consultancy. And I thought I was there to help you. And you sat me down and, and you started asking me all these questions, you know, and you went up to the whiteboard, you know, and, and at the time I was, I was still, uh, you know, I probably had half the staff that we have now, and, and so I was wearing twice as many hats as I do now. And I remember you, um, you just asking me questions and going to the whiteboard, and you and you and, and you really were, were drilling down into like, what did I, you know, what did I hate to do, you know? And I and I remember saying, what was I not good at? And I was saying, you know, invoicing and 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 my my accounting and my and my accounts receivables were high. And then I said something like, but I really enjoy when I get to you know, design or I get to do some creative and then you were writing this stuff down. And ultimately I remember you said, if you had, a, if you had a CFO that hated, hated their job, was not good at it uh, and had, and kept so much money out on the street that it was starting to affect your business, you know, what would you do with that CFO? And, and I said, I, I would fire him. And you looked at me and you said, you've got to fire yourself. You know, in other words, I needed to, I needed to hire somebody to help me in that area in my business. And, and that, just that little exercise took just took my business to another level and now I had been to talk I had done all these different executive programs on how to scale but it wasn't as impactful as that as that exercise and and I just think you have this this ability to do that and and um and it's a gift and you're helping so many people I know that's what what's ins what inspires you is that I, I really believe you have a sincere you get a sincere uh, fulfillment out of seeing other people kind of break through and, and, um, not, not nice segue into, uh, your crystal, uh, your crystal ceiling, but, uh, tell us a little bit about these books, what inspired them. Um, and, and leading up to this latest one, which I really want us to dive into because, um, I think it's amazing. Uh, I love the whole metaphor. Um, to just, just kind of, how did, how did we get to this giraffe concept and, 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 and this idea of giraffe money? Okay, so um, for those people listening at home, uh, Ramon has an honorary doctorate, but he should have an honorary <laughs> law degree because he just asked the person on the stand six questions in one question. And so, so he said, like, I get one question, but rather than be, rather than be a child and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my one wish and wish for nine wishes. I'm great. I'd say, I have, I have one question. I'm going to ask you six questions. So if I can remember them in order, you asked about the books and uh I've written 16 books. The first 12 were 12, 13 were all about driving business to me and my firm. Mm -hmm. The last three were all about me trying to help other people. And no surprise, the last three of the three that hit the bestseller list on the first day mm -hmm. uh, and have all been, you know, they've all done pretty well. And the one two ago was six secrets to leveraging success. So this is a book for entrepreneurs. It's a book for, oh, it's a book for anybody who's successful but really this book is about the difference between being successful and being super successful. And you fit right down the middle of, of this book, which is someone who's working really hard, busting ass, doing all the things they need to do. And that's how you got there is by working hard, going to school, getting grades, doing continuing education, all the things that you can do for you. But ultimately you're never going to have any peace in life or get to a really high level until you can let go of all of that stuff and leverage it. So this book is all about leverage. And I interviewed a bunch of millionaires and billionaires, and I've, I've had the pleasure of consulting with thousands of millionaires, hundreds of 20 to $50 million you know, net worth families and three billionaires. So I, I've seen a fair amount of wealth. And um, 
I wouldn't put myself, I mean, I'm not in the $50 million category, but I'm in the more than $1 million category and closer to the one than the 50 if they're doing the math at home. But the, um, but the idea in this book is that you have to get past leverage and realize that you have to utilize other people's skills and do the thing that you do well and get rid of everything else because that's where you get your energy. That's where you get your fulfillment. Um, so I built that book for business owners and that was, uh, and that book was very helpful and we were consulting with a lot of business owners at the time. The more recent book that just came out is uh, Giraffe Money and it's See Better Paths to Elevated Wealth and the giraffe metaphor came in in between. And where the giraffe metaphor came from, well, the obvious is, do you want to be big and do you want to stand above your, you know, your colleagues or you want to be the better salesperson, the bigger manager, the better father, the better basketball coach, whatever it is you want to be. That's the obvious one. But the, the, the more interesting thing is, as I started diving into the giraffe, uh, what became clear to me was that it was a perfect fit for me. And the reason why I say that is, is I did something that I would recommend everybody on who's listening to this do. And that is ask people the one, the one reason why they hired you or the one reason why they work with you or the one reason why they like you. Give me the one word descriptor of who you are. Um, or ask them, you know, and if it's not one word and they give you a sentence, that's fine. But what I, I went back to all my clients and asked that question because sometimes I'm giving tax advice and sometimes I'm giving financial advice and sometimes I was given psychology advice and sometimes I was giving, I did a lot of different things and it was, someone asked me, what do you do? And it's like, this elevator ride is not long enough for me to tell you. So I got, I, I just pass, <laughs> tell me what you do. And what I found when I asked people at the end of a meeting was, was this helpful is the question I always asked. And you know, they would have left early if the answer had been no. So people would say yes, and I wouldn't just get excited and pat myself on the back with the yes, this was helpful. I asked, how is this helpful? And the answer I got time and time and time again, I think 25 meetings in a row was, I'm looking at this differently now. I'm looking at my career differently. I'm looking at my role differently. I'm looking at my life differently. I'm looking at my marketing differently. I'm looking at my clients differently. I'm looking at something differently. So that's where the whole see differently. And I thought, well, okay, I want to see differently. What's the best is this a looking glass? Is this a, what's the right thing? And I couldn't find the right thing. And then you start looking at the giraffe and you realize it was a herd, herd animal. It ended up evolving to not be a herd animal. And in the book, Giraffe Money, I contrast zebra and giraffe. And the idea that the zebra are in a herd, they're eating grasses, um, their heads are buried in the weeds, which is like most business owners or most people in life are just doing what they do every day. They get up and they they do the same stuff. And it's very similar to the, giraffe, the zebra life, which is wherever the herd's going, I'll just keep eating until, and when we walk, I'll walk. And when we stop, I'll stop and eat. When we walk, we walk. And, and when you look up, all you see is, uh, you know, the ass in front of you. And so, you know, one of the chapter's titles is uh, avoid the masses because often the M is silent. And that's, you know, and that's, uh, I mean, that really is one of my, it's one of my most reposted posts in social media too. But the, um, that idea that, People are just following the masses and doing what other people want, which for a lot of people is fine. But if you aspire to have anything great or to do great things or have great impact or have great love or passion or anything else, you're going to have to get away from the herd. So mm -hmm. this whole giraffe thing is elevating your perspective so you can see a better path and it's a better path for you. So unlike the giraffes that are migratory that, I mean, the, the zebra that kind of follow the grasses, giraffes are, are not migratory and because they eat the leaves on the tree, they're constantly looking out at the horizon while they're eating. So it's this idea that I'm always thinking ahead. I'm not just burying my head. Mm -hmm. And then trees have roots that are often as deep as the tree is tall. So if you think about that with grass, if grass is four inches long, if there's no water within four inches of the soil, it's going to die. But for a 20 foot tree, there could be water 20 feet under the surface and you can still be in the middle of the desert. So giraffes go places other animals can't. Uh, they see things other people can't. They reach things other people won't. And so it just started to, and the more I dug into it, you know, I've got 25, 30 lessons for both the giraffe money book and the upcoming be the giraffe book that are, it just, it just was, it just came to me that this is my thing and this is my story and my brand and everything that I do is about doing things differently. And that's what I, you know, it's really what I aspire to do is to help people. And it's not, I'm not the great therapist. I'm not, um, I'm not unlocking any crazy key you know, from a psychology standpoint, other than just getting people to feel comfortable with, all great success came from people who left the herd and did something else. Yeah. And it just gives people the confidence to say, Hey man, you're different. You didn't, you don't have a marketing degree from Kellogg, but you've done more marketing consultations for Warren Buffett than 99.9% .9 of the marketing grads from Kellogg. Right. I mean, you just yeah. did it. So, you know, 
the yeah, hell well, with you? Like, so I, what? I, there's, there's different paths. Different paths, a, a, absolutely. And I think part of what I love is over the years, we've been working on the branding and I've seen the evolution of the giraffe and how it's, you've built some good brand equity. I mean, it, 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 I first saw it in the Doctori logo. Um, then we kind of applied it to Jarvis Tower where a, a group of giraffes is called the tower, right? So kind of used that and, and, then, uh, and then you went solo and now, and now it's, it's be the giraffe and giraffe money and, and all that. But the, the question I have for you is, is success always based on money? Can somebody that has, yeah, if somebody that has altruistic uh, aspirations uh, or has a different view of success, would they benefit from this book? Yeah, because the book is not, I had this conversation with my wife the other day where um, my 15 year old nephew is doing a book report uh, on my book. And I thought, look at him, he's, he's the one person in my family who's actually read it. And, and, and my wife made the comment, she's like, I read it when you were editing it, but I'm not interested in finance. And I said, the book's about a third finance. It's mm -hmm. about a third, a third of it is practical applications of very high end financial things or things that you could do or mm -hmm. do things to mimic what high end people do without the price or the aggravation. But the idea of how do you think about money is really important. So in the new business I'm creating, Draft University, this idea of success is you've got what you do in your life, your corp, your corporate, you know, your, your vocation, your business, your purpose, your passion. You, most people have something they want to do, but the, but the main reason why they don't is usually a money thing. So if we ask, you know, if I'm asking everybody rhetorically on who's listening to the podcast, what's more important to you, your health or your money? And they're going to say health. What's more important, your family or your money? They're going to say family. What's more important, having purpose, passion, and impact in this world or having money? Purpose. Most people are going to say purpose, passion. And some, some will say money. But with family, and with, with family and with health, it's almost always they say that. Mm -hmm. Yet, when I ask people what are their dreams, what are the things that I'm doing right now in this whole COVID, quarantine, uh, crazy political situation, racial injustice, I mean, all the stuff that's going on in this crazy you know, Roman empire that we live in that's on the verge of collapse, the, um, everybody tells me that they have some changes. And I just did a bunch of webinars for a big financial firm for the thousands of clients. And it was, I bet you in the last four months, you have changed the way you look at your health and lifestyle, mm -hmm. your family and your profession, your career, your business, whatever you do. And in some way, you probably have changes in all three, but there's going to be at least one major epiphany of, I need to go live in the country. I need to live closer to my kids. I need to, I need to do my own thing. Finally, I need something that if you have a great epiphany of something you want to change, why haven't you done it yet? And if the answer is, I can't afford it, where's the money gonna come from? How am I gonna pay my bills? Well, you already know there's something that's important to you, but you've now put money ahead of it. And that's just a horrible way to live. So I grew up, my parents got divorced, we had no money, mom on welfare going back to school full time. Uh, you know, I just, money was a big deal. It stopped us from doing things. So the joy that I get back to your question 12 minutes ago or comment about empathy is it does matter. And I hate that people have these thoughts about money that stop them from doing the things that they, that they love. So I truly believe if you do the things you love, the money will come. I couldn't tell you within a degree of, uh, I couldn't tell you with, with the, in order of magnitude, how much money is in my bank account. Like I have absolutely no idea, none. And it's, and it varies dramatically. And I do like one big deal a year and it makes me some money for the year. And I usually, and I do a couple of little things here and there, but it's, um, I just don't think about it and I choose not to worry about it. And people will say, well, that's easy for you. You have more money, but I didn't, I didn't worry about it when I didn't have money. It just wasn't my, it just wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. So even though I know that if you focus on the things you love, the money will come. And there's a lot of transformational character stuff that I do to help people with that mindset. The reason for giraffe money is to help people get out of their own way and to think about money differently and do some practical things so that they can, so they can pursue the things that they love. And when they pursue things they love, they're better neighbors, they're better fathers, better mothers, better kids, better friends, better citizens. I mean, that's, it's just, yeah. life's just better when people aren't worried about the dollar all the time. Right. And I love that. And that's why I kind of threw you that softball because, um, you know, I, I, I listened in on the presentation you gave recently to that big financial firm and, and uh, to their clients. And I, and I thought that that, that that idea of those life changes, I know you spent a lot of time with, with Jack Canfield um, and, and there's the halo effect, you know, where you go and you, you spend time close to him and then you come back and you kind of interpret some of his, his practices in, into yours and, and then you, you help others. And, and um, I could hear that in that, in that talk 
that you gave and, and we've hired you, you know, as a firm. And I think for our listeners uh, that you are available to help teams because uh, I think you've made us a better team in, in what you've uh, helped us do uh, with, with regards to our thinking uh, and so forth. So um, it, it's just, uh, tell us a little bit about the impact that you can make on, 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 on teams. Um, we hire you, like I said, for our hackathon every year, which is where we get away on a company retreat. And this year, you, you know, you, 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 you know, you piped in live. One of these days we're going to come down there to your compound and, you know, hang out in the pool and, and all that. But uh, until then, tell us a little bit uh, about how you help teams and corporations and, and how it is this, you know, that, that exercise where we got out on the ledge and we were going to jump off. Um, that really illustrated to us the power of thinking and how much the mind uh, can impact our lives. Yeah, so you, you just you just outdid yourself. You had six questions last time. Now you just gave me seven. So I see you're I see you're ramping up as we get further in. You're getting more. <laughs> and I, and getting I'm, more I'm, and I'm trying to wrap up, by the way. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, so this so take a lesson from Ramon. He's ready to wrap up, so he throws me seven more questions. And as the uh, no, but if the, hopefully this is helpful. The um, the first thing is about the Canfield stuff. So. I, intuitively, I always asked a lot of good questions and I would be able to connect with people. The big difference between having worked with Jack, being the vice president for his strategic partnerships and working on some big side deals for him, doing some, some videos together and some other stuff that's on my website and on YouTube. Um, what I learned from him with his 40, 50 years of psychology is, uh, is how to connect with people from a distance that I don't need to be sitting five feet away and really get into it. So what are the tools that help people get in touch with the things that matter to them. So what that did for, as far as up leveling, up leveling is it allowed me to help companies and their teams if they're big. I don't need to sit down with everybody. And I also help companies connect with their clients and their future clients and prospective uh, clients by giving them things that will help them connect and get closer. So that part was really valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that the other thing too is unlike a lot of consulting gigs that are extraordinarily um, time consuming, that I don't really care about your accounts receivable process. I mean, I have the business acumen, I can look at that stuff, but really the, what was much more important for you is not for me to dig into all your accounts receivable and what your process was. It was just to help you realize you were the wrong person for that job and you were holding the company back mm -hmm. and it was making you miserable and you were working crazy hours and you know, all that was going on. So the thing about doing strategy and vision consulting for a company is it's generally done in a very short amount of time. It usually, I've had people come to my house for eight hour sessions and we're usually done in three to five hours, you know, sometimes two to four hours with a whole new, here's a here's new messaging. Here's some other vision. Uh, I do zoom calls all the time for people for an hour and they find that it's, it's impactful because I'm just trying to help them. I can't know your industry. I can't know your internal processes. I mean, I could, if I were Deloitte and McKinsey and I wanted to bill you $500,000 and I could, give you essentially a business colonoscopy for the next, you know, for the next six months, Ouch. what they do when they go in. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends on what you're into, I guess, but the, um, <laughs> you know, so the, um, can you take but me out rather than do that, or, yeah. that's what after. And the, um, <laughs> but the, um, right. Cause I don't want to have anything but, but, in my stomach. Yeah. I got you. That's, <laughs> that's right. Very good. So the, um, we, we're going to be here all week, everybody. So the, um, <laughs> The, uh, the, the really big part of this, though, is that you know the answers. So it's my job to help people see what, what else could happen and help them just find different things and figure out what's really bothering them. And, and it's no surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who's already in business to realize that whatever you think the business's primary challenges are, are probably not what the people who work with you or for you think they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as an example, one group I did a lot of work with, um, down in, well, you did some work. It's a mutual client. I won't mention their name down in North yeah. Carolina mm -hmm. um, that I referred to you and you've done some great work for them was for them. It was a constant, a constant um, flow of fire drills where the owner of the company would, you know, somebody would call him and ask him for something and he would quickly take people off their projects to go return this one client thing. So they'd have it to the person within an hour. And what the irony of that is that though the entrepreneur may want things in an hour, a big company doesn't expect things in an hour mm -hmm. because they work relatively slowly. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the most, the most impactful recommendation I gave to them was after they said, when I asked them, how much of your day is spent doing, ending the, how much of your day is spent doing the thing that you woke up thinking you were going to do? And the answers <laughs> ranged from 5%, well, from zero. Somebody said, none. <laughs> I get to the office and my whole day, it's like, Dang, here's it's my to-do list. They're like, great, we're not going to yeah. do that. Here, here's your list. <laughs> that um, to, you know, to 50%, but nobody was above 50. And so 
I mean, the thing that we instilled in them was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings, the CEO cannot contact anybody at the company for anything. So they have these three and a half hours I like that. a day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that nobody can ask anybody for anything. Like you work on your stuff, but there is no email, no text, no instant messaging, no knocking on anybody's door, do your job. And that's only for 10 hours, 10 and a half hours of the you know, theoretical 40 hour a week that no business I know works. But, mm-hmm. but it was only a quarter of the hours you expect people to be in the office was quiet time to just do your stuff. And that came from us saying, how much more work could you get done if you got 10 hours that you knew nobody was going to bother you? Mm. And people said, oh, my God, I'd go through the roof. And so we did that. And the yeah. CEO was very reluctant. And I said, stop. Just give it to them. And if, you, if, if productivity doesn't go up after a month, then go back. But what is yeah. it going to cost you to, like, you think they're wrong, so let's give them a chance to prove that they're wrong. <laughs> and they weren't. And so, like, sometimes it's that, but that's what came out. Right. That's what came out of the discussion because I asked a lot of questions. What's stopping you from doing your job? How could you get more work done? So, you know, when people hire me to do, you know, it might seem expensive to hire me for an hour um, or two or whatever it might be, but it's the time that you save. I mean, I don't need research papers. I don't I mean people, you might want to get some stuff together, but the, the prep work is not significant, as you know. Mm-hmm. And again, we're just trying to help people pull their heads away from the, um, you know, from the day to day. And mm-hmm. I'm sure you've heard the story of the roast. Have you heard this one of a daughter asked her mom, you know, you have this roast in the oven and I see that you cut off the ends of the roast when you put it in. Like, why do you do that? Is that for flavor? Does it let it, is there some air? Does it let juice out pressure? She's like, I don't know. My mother did it that way. And so then the mother asked the, mm-hmm. and she goes to the grandmother who's, you know, whatever in her fifties, forties, you know, grandma, why, what, you know, mama said you did this. Why did you do it? And, and she's like, I don't know. Like my mother did it that way. And then they go up to the, you know, they finally get to the great grandmother and say, Hey, everybody's been cutting this thing. Like, can you tell us the map, you know, the secret of why you did this? The and she said, so yeah, I, I, I had a small pan. <laughs> yeah. Like it didn't fit yeah. in the pan. Like, that was, you know, I had this little pan. It's all I had. So I cut the edges and there's, you know, there's so many things in our lives that right. we just do and we don't stop and think why? maybe we should. Yeah. yeah. May, maybe we should do something else. Or why are we doing this again? And let's just double check why we're doing it. Mm-hmm. And so just that, just that exercise of feeling free to say, let's do it. Um, you know, I th- again, you don't need to hire me, but hiring somebody who has the authority to say, no, everybody's, everybody's ideas matter and everybody can give some input. And then there's just somebody who's not your boss. So somebody questioning you on your management style, Ramon, but, but you have to do that person's, uh, you know, you have to do that person's uh, performance appraisal two weeks later. They're probably like, I'm not going to bring up anything right now because... <laughs> you know, because I, I want to make sure I don't, I don't ruffle any feathers, but if you've got somebody on the outside asking questions and they feel safe yeah. then it's a different, it just creates a free flow. And, you know, and the further, the further, the bigger your company gets, the further away you get from the client. So the more you need to tap into the people who are there. Excellent. So very, great, I mean, corporate a, retreats. Yeah. No, having some corporate retreat and having somebody who's not you mm-hmm. lead it so that people actually feel free. Um, I love it. Yeah, I, I, I love being just one of the team in those moments. You know, I really, I really enjoy that. You know, I think it's important. Um, I don't have all the great ideas. That's why I hire guys like you to come in and, and help pull those out of us. Um, now we've gone longer than expected. I knew this was going to happen because you're, you know, we're going to have to bring you back and, and there's so much more we can talk about. Um, before we close, how do they, how do folks buy your book and how can they find you or co- what's the best way to hire you or contact you to learn more about you or hire you? Yeah, I think, well, you know, the cheapest way is buy the, you know, there's a couple of books on Amazon, six secrets to leveraging success, which is a couple of years old and the brand new bestseller is draft money. So draft money on, um, on Amazon. So if you just put in giraffe money book, it'll pop up and it's uh, a very cool cover that Ramon and his team did with the giraffe and notice all the very cool, subtle things in there and the types and the letters and some of the interesting font choices. And uh, so check, so check out his handiwork when you look at the book. Uh, so check it out. If you love the book, I'd love a five-star review. If you didn't love the book, you should send a handwritten letter to Ramon. <laughs> that, would be, that would be great. He'll, he'll compile those and get those back to me. Sure. Uh, and then uh, the website is chrisjarvis.me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm at, uh, you know, it was a, a joke. I set up an Instagram, Chris Ray Jarvis, which is a long story for another, uh, another day about move. Well, I'll tell it quickly as we leave with the joke, which is, uh, I moved to Texas and in Texas, your driver's license has your first middle and last name. So when I gave my license to somebody in Texas, the first week I was here, it said Christopher Raymond Jarvis. And the guy said, Oh, 
do you go by, and I was good, and I'm, I'm assuming he's saying, you go, do you go by Chris? Do you go by Christopher? Do you go by Ray? Do you go by Jarvis? Do you go by, he said, do you go by Chris Ray? It's like, no, I, I'll go by anything but Chris Ray. And so at one point I just started I, as a joke. I created Chris Ray Jarvis on Instagram and uh, I did it as a joke just to follow That's my kids country, and see what they were country doing. Country singer alter ego is Chris Ray. Yeah. That's yeah. Chris Ray, Chris Ray Jarvis is my country music and um, moonshine distribution company name that I have going on here in Texas. And it's uh, yeah. no. And so, and then all of a sudden you get 10,000 followers. You're like, oh, I guess I can't change this. So, um, <laughs> so on Instagram is Chris Ray Jarvis. I've got pages on Facebook and LinkedIn and yeah. you know, feel free to, if I can be of some assistance, I, I love helping entrepreneurs get to the next level and you know, help them launch, help them explode, um, which is probably a bad thing to say after launch. So let's go with help them launch, help, yeah. help them go soar. faster. Help them soar and keep on keep Help on them soar, that's right. Now. Continue yeah. to accelerate. And, and, yeah. and you've certainly helped us, Chris, and we're, we're extremely grateful to have you in our corner, have you as an advisor, uh, have you on the show. So thanks for being here. We're going to do it again. This has been a blast. Uh, everyone, thank you for listening to this episode of Mission Control. Until next time, this is Ramon Peralta with Peralta Design and We Launch Brands. Thank you for taking this journey with us. To learn more about Peralta Design and our work, go to www.peraltadesign.com and subscribe to keep up with the crew.